Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and this week is part two of competition painting. We're going to finish this incredible figure from Mindwork Games and I am really excited about what we're going to do today. So let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get into the technique and learn it Vinci V. In part one we painted the skin. You can find that video basically uh, right before this one. Uh, but if you're curious uh, about that, you can go back and check that out. And you saw how much effort we put into the skin. And that's because it's really the central focal point of the model. And skin itself is very complex and layered. Now it's time to tackle everything else. That doesn't mean we're going to spend less effort. It just means it's somewhat simpler to resolve some of these other elements. And so let's head over to the desk. Let's get painting. All right, our first goal is to start with the hair. Now, when I saw this figure, I don't know why, but what sparked in my mind, I, I looked at the original art, you can actually see it behind me, um, but that actually wasn't what caught my eye. Something about this figure to me, maybe it was like the nature of the bracers uh, that she's wearing, said poison ivy. Uh, and so red hair it is. And we're gonna do red hair. And as I take you through this, this is gonna be pretty traditional rich red hair. So we're not gonna go into too much orange, although you can do that. There's all sorts of options. But there's basically two major phases I want to walk you through. I begin by laying something down that's pretty dark and purple. This is effectively my shadow color. I just get a, I get a nice established base coat. I want all of the black gone, but I'm not really going to allow much of this to show through into the final product, and it will appear quite dark once we get our brighter colors on. From that point, I then start blocking in all of the different color areas and zones of the hair. So hair, as I've talked about many times on this channel, is very satin and so has these areas of highlight. And effectively, it's going to create a sort of halo around the top of the head and then wherever it bounces out and flips up and it has upward facing parts, you'll get more light catches. So I begin by just building the red. And when I am doing this, I am not, not, uh, just putting this on the highlight. That's the first place I see everybody go wrong with hair is they just like sort of dry brush up and leave the recesses super dark so that even in the, the highlight areas, you can still see all the way down to that deepest shadow. But that's not how hair works. In things like this, where you have lots of texture in the upward facing areas and the areas of high highlight, the shadow tone is your mid-tone. So I'm going to build up those areas of hair, creating the different color zones as I build up through the, uh, through the actual uh, more intense red and then eventually up integrating the flesh tone in there uh, just to make sure that I've got all that done. Now, as I get into the high highlights, you'll notice that I eventually switch from just laying on flat layers. Basically, once I cross well over the mid-tone, I'm now going to start applying it through thin hashes. So really, that's the key there. As I'm building up these highlights and working in these thin lines, thin, sharp, hashy lines, you want a sharp brush, I build up higher and higher, covering less and less and less each time with my highlights. And I'm placing the highlights where I would expect them. The light is sort of over her right shoulder just slightly, so I'm going to slightly accentuate the light over to the right side of the halo. Uh, I have to work around the sort of headpiece that she's wearing and so on. But that's where I focus up my light. Now, once I've got the general color map down, the next step is to then sort of glaze to bring it all together. This is a relatively quick step, but I use some thin red to just glaze everything together. And I'm very, 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 very thin here. Uh, and that's part of the intention. We really just want to filter it. I want that highlight to still be present but it's just a quick step to kind of smooth everything together. Now comes the real work. Since this is for competition, that means it's time to do the real real. So now I go through in half steps and quarter steps of all of my different colors that I've mixed, and I start applying thin lines on all of the edges to draw them together. So re-accentuating some of the highlight or blending in the highlight area into the mid-tone or the mid-tone into the shadow. Drawing down some of the lines, breaking up those more rectangular color patterns that I laid down so that they're uneven. And that's just it. You don't want one band of light to be solid. 
hair has all the individual strands and so we're going to create that variance by doing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sharp thin lines over all of that space. So there we go, hair's good to go. Now it's time to move on to the other major part of this figure and that's the dress. Now with the dress, the goal here is to keep it a little more simple. I'm not gonna be doing something that's crazy with texture, at least on the main part of the dress. What we're actually gonna do is some transparent stuff later, but we'll get to that. Uh, and the idea here for the main part of her dress, which is quite thick and clearly uh, folded on top of itself, is to have it respect the light of the rest of the figure. When you're doing cloth, even when we're going to keep it relatively simple, we want to make sure that it's still heating the same lighting scheme overall. So I'm just building up through the greens into incorporating a warm yellow. Again, across all of my highlights, I have set her in this warm environment. And that was really important. So the red hair has a warm highlight, the skin has a warm highlight, so her dress needs a warm highlight. Everything on your piece has to fit in the same color temperature to show that she exists in a singular environment. Like there is some light that is being cast and it is of a singular temperature. Now, it may react slightly differently. You don't necessarily need to use the same highlight paint on every single surface, though you can. Uh, but in this case, it's more just about them all having the same tone, uh, the same uh, temperature, than it is about them being the exact same paint. So as I continue to build up those highlights, uh, we're going to bring everything together. Now, moving on from just like, you can see that's pretty straightforward. I'm just accentuating the, the various folds and things like that and where the light would catch, focusing most of the light again, to her upper right side. You'll notice this whole time I didn't touch like the breasts on uh, uh, the, the part that's covering her breasts. And that's because I thought this would be a good chance in a couple different places to do some transparent cloth. It does very much look like she's wearing almost a piece of uh, like lingerie or something like that. That's almost what that looks like. So I thought, eh, we'll just lean into that. And plus it's a good chance to have a little area where you can kind of show off your skills. Competition figures are about finding individual places to show off kind of your skills and what you're doing. So I paint sort of the breasts in skin tone, matching the skin of the actual uh, body itself. That's just basically, I do filter it just a little more cold as I'm working, integrating a tiny amount of the green from the dress from the beginning, because we're eventually going to, to cover it. And then I go ahead and just start glazing on some of the green. And once I glaze that, that's to bring back and integrate and make it seem as though there's a layer of that thin green transparent or translucent, as it were, cloth over uh, her actual chest, right? And so then once that's done, I go back and I blend with a little more, mix the skin with some green, glaze in some skin. Basically, I work back and forth, always making sure to end with some very light filters of the green. So you've got, I've got to kind of bring it together. It's a lot of back and forth process, but eventually I think we get to a good place where it looks like transparent cloth. You'll notice it's also happening along her hip and leg. There wasn't a lot of places where the dress was actually resting comfortably against her skin where it would transparently show. So I wanted that to be very light there. Now, one thing I do then is go ahead and get out my airbrush. And I'm gonna use the airbrush with some thin glazes of some greens and green yellows to go ahead and add back the saturation, the pop, the intensity, and to smooth out my previous work. So I go through basically three different layers with the airbrush. I'm not masking anything, I don't need to. I'm working incredibly thin and incredibly careful and tight with this 0.2 millimeter needle. Uh, and this is uh, my Harder and Steinbeck again here, and it's just a great airbrush. So. I first start with the yellow green to add the richness, the warmth of the, the color tone. Then I come in with the green tone. And the goal there is to make sure that uh, I, I reinstantiate the saturation. I really want that green to pop. I want it to be intense. And I want it to counterbalance the intense red that's ringing around her head, using the, the show of the complementary colors to be in place there. 
Finally, I actually grab some red purple, which is going to act as a really nice way to deepen the shadows. And then on the sort of hidden side of her dress that's away from the light where I want very deep shadows on that side of the figure, I go in and lightly apply a few filters to darken down my shadows and bring everything together. With those three steps done, the dress is ready to go. That brings me to a few final details on this miniature. Specifically, I need to work on the uh, gold, and so I'll show you here what I did. This is a relatively simple process. Uh, I just kind of built it up through a couple of different tones. There's not a lot of gold on her. You know, it's like a couple little, um, like little star on her chest, the tiny little crosses, and the little tiny thing on her head. So really, there's not much to do here. Um, but it's just building up the tones and making sure we are, again, placing the specular highlights on all of these so that it matches the lighting scheme I would expect with the rest of the figure. Uh, so after I kind of build up through my layers, I go back with a few glazes of the deeper yellow to reinstantiate saturation. Again, gold and non-metallic lives in the saturation, and so I very much want that to be present here and, you know, kind of rocking and rolling. All right. Now, off camera, I painted her eyes. Look, I'm sorry, I didn't film it. They're very small eyes given the size of this figure, and I just can't do it. I have to get out my magnifiers. I'm working like an inch away from the figure. There is no way to film it for a competition. I'm sorry. I have videos on painting eyes. I'll try to do one, another one in the future where I deep dive this, but I, I just didn't, I couldn't film it. It's unfilmable. I'm sorry. All right, but that does leave one major chunk of this figure we still have to do, specifically the big rock. Now, an important element of competition painting is that everything has to be done to the same level as any other part of it. And so in other words, when it comes to things like the rock she's sitting on or whatever you're gonna do, you can't just phone that in because it's a piece of stone, right? If that really, like frankly, if that sucks, then any judge is gonna look at that and go, well, you just totally phoned it in there and mark down the piece overall. You have to put in equal amounts of effort to everything on the piece. You've got to love and cherish and, and heed every element from top to bottom, okay? So, with that being said, I start by laying down just a little dark blue on the sort of, this rock is really interesting. It's got kind of this rough part that's chipped away and then it's got the top part. In the art, the um, Brahm kind of had it all as uh, singular in, in, in tone, but I actually wanted to kind of create a little more contrast here. Now, this is really blue, and there's no blue in the composition, but don't worry, we'll, we'll fix it up. I mix in green as well as a little white and lighten it up, and I'm just using this stiffly hashy, dry brushy technique to kind of bring out the texture, especially in the lit area. Now, as I rotate it around, eventually I will stop covering that area with the highlight, so I don't go as high on the back of the figure, because again, I want to show that singular lighting pattern that is reflected on her face, in her hair, on her dress. It needs to be on the stone as well. We have to carry our lighting schemes through every element of the piece. So as I build up here, I'm paying very careful attention to that. Once the blue is kind of in place, I then go to the regular stone. And yes, I'm starting with something that looks very pink and strange, but trust me, this is exactly how you want to start stone. You want to start stone with color, not with something black or white or gray, okay? Stone being in neutral tones is the enemy of visual interest. We want hue. So I start with this pink and I eventually just start working in black as I work it around towards the shadow side. Uh, then what I'm going to do is slowly integrate a little neutral white and ice yellow. And basically what I do is just build it up, build it up, build it up, but not through layers. I build it up through stipples, stabs, hashes, dashes, dots, all of that kind of stuff to get that rough texture of the stone and bring out the beauty of the sculpt. And you notice as I build it up and build it up and build it up, I'm covering less and less space each time building it up until I eventually have this nice light catch that's going to really fundamentally set the golden angle of the miniature. That's just the best viewing angle for your miniature. Especially when you're working for competition, you want some perfect angle where you can photograph the miniature from, where you can share and display the miniature from, that'll display its best thing. That doesn't mean it doesn't work when you turn it around. It just means, much like humans, you got a good side and maybe a not as good side, right? So, uh, I build up that light. I do throw down a quick wash over the whole thing as well, 
uh, just to kind of ju just to get some Nuln Oil in there because I wanted a little bit of soft black in that shadows, but I thin it out because my brush is full of liquid and moist. I just want a little bit of dirtiness of tone. That A little bit of staining is actually going to do me well here. I then go back in over several areas and re-stipple uh, and, and dash and dot to again build up some of the light and the texture and really take it up to pure ice yellow at that tiniest little point of light on the, on the stone. Once that's done, I then I'm going to do some dashes and tiny streaks and the light catches. I go around and trace out all the various elements of like where I see tiny depressions or scratches or things like that. I catch those with little edge highlights and under lights and things like that. But that's not done. We're not there in it enough yet. This is like a piece of stone that's clearly sitting out in nature. So I go through several different colors. I make like a green brown, a brown black, a pure green. And I do some streaks and uh, stains over the actual stone. And this is a really important step. This thing exists, it's out in nature, and putting some green stains and streaks and stuff like that on the stone helps to tie it into the figure in the same way the warm red brown will also make it feel like it's both credibly existing somewhere in the world, but also that it's uh, tied to her since it now matches the warm colors and we get a little bit of that red that's in her hair reflected in the red of the brown all tying these hues and values together through these very simple notes of just like echoes and reflections creates this sort of harmony in the piece overall. So with that done, hey, she's done. Uh, so let me share some photos with you. This is what she looks like right now. I think she came out pretty cool. Remember, this is part of a Kickstarter from Mindwork Games. You can find the link for it down in the description. All of the figures in this Kickstarter are absolutely exceptional. This one was a complete pleasure from top to bottom to paint. Remember, it's all based on Brahm art. Uh, I mean, like, always been one of my favorite artists. I love fantasy art in that style, and it's just great. They, the, the way that the pieces were rendered and created pays an incredible tribute to the artist. Uh, so check it out. Link is down in the description. Uh, I really couldn't recommend this enough. With that, I'll say thank you so much. I really appreciate you watching. Don't forget to check out the Kickstarter. If you've got any questions, drop those down in the comments below. Give this a like or subscribe if you want. We've got new videos here every Saturday. Uh, I'm always happy to have new subscribers on. And, and if you're watching this, share it with someone else. That's really the nicest thing you can do and doesn't cost you anything. If you do want to support the channel with some money, hey, there's lots of ways you can do so. There's affiliate links down below. Uh, if you want to pick up your hobby supplies, those don't cost you anything extra. In fact, they often save you money and they give a nice kickback to the channel. That's my painting light and my paints and all that stuff are down there. As well, we've got a Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. If you're interested in trying your hand at some display or competition painting, or you're just working on your next army, either way, we'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.